Hi, I'm Rob Langton from Development Ready. Our interview series delves into the lives of Australia's most respected property thought leaders and decision makers and uncovers what makes them tick. This is the interview. Mr Triggerboff, it's an honour having you on our program this afternoon. Let's start with 2020. How has the year been for you and the Meriton Group? It had more problems than usual, but a developer always has problems, so we're used to it. But it had a lot. We had the virus, of course, that suddenly you, we couldn't lease service apartments. Just never happened before. Sometimes it gets worse, better, but never like that. But we overcome all these problems. We have to. And, and that's it. So I don't think that we suffered in any way. You've been developing property for over 50 years and you've developed more than 75,000 apartments. Has your philosophy to property development changed over those years? Yeah, well, it has, of course. It changes because the market changes. So my philosophy can be perfect, but it doesn't mean that it'll be perfect forever. I'll give you an example. Years ago, we were very scared of having shops under the apartments because there was no demand for shops. But now shops are in high demand. So we're quite happy to build shops. Years ago, we never worried too much about whether there was a view or we were in the middle of shopping centers. We just thought oh, it's a good area or a bad area. Now we're particular. If there's views, there's better. If we have shops, it's better. So we, that's why, that's the way it changes. And reflecting on JobKeeper and Home Builder, the two government grants, do you think they should have been extended to apartment developers rather than just land developers? Definitely, yeah. They should be. But they helped us a bit, not enough. The big problem is that the uh, stamp duty is paid on the whole unit with the land. But the stamp duty is paid only on the land for the cottage. And our particular problem is that we depend a lot upon overseas people. Uh, we need migrants. Migrants come into the city. Uh, students come into the city. And these are the two that don't arrive. So that's why our section of the market has suffered more. Now, you were in the Gold Coast last week. How are you finding the occupancy rates at your hotels, both in the Gold Coast and in Sydney? Have they rebounded? I think the, the Gold Coast uh, has been very good. Gold Coast always very good. The capital of the country <laughs> for, for that. So Gold Coast was very good. In the city, in the beginning, we really suffered, but at the moment, it's, so, it's getting better. It's all right. You mentioned the Gold Coast there. What is it that attracted you to first start developing in the Gold Coast? And what projects do you have on the go in the Gold Coast currently? My wife and we like Gold Coast, right? So we go there, we walk on the beach. The people there are very friendly. We know people, so that's all right. So I found that I was going there more and more and doing nothing. I was, I was a bit bored there, so I started to build. And at that moment, at that time, the councils were giving, me, were giving me the creeps here. So that's why I thought, well, I'd build some there. Of course, the problem with Gold Coast is that there is no money. So you can never make as much money there as here. So you have to understand that it doesn't matter who you are or what you are. That's the problem of Gold Coast. But still, we were very successful with the service departments there. And we have huge buildings, you know, 50 stories, 60 stories, 70 stories. And people like it, the big view and all that. Now, back in August, you were leasing out circa 200 apartments a week, but at a 5 to 20% discount. Has this rebounded back to pre-COVID levels? I mean, it's hard to say. Some areas it has, some it hasn't. I would say average now would be about 8% below. But it's still below. But it's creeping up. Whereas the service apartments... Uh, rates, they've come back. Since the start of the pandemic, you made a point of ensuring that you're a visible presence here in the Meriton head office and your staff were coming in as well. How important do you think that was that you were here and that your staff were here rather than working from home? 
working from home is nonsense. And I'm very disappointed that it has been done. I don't think that Australians were ever too keen on working. I don't mean it as an insult. I mean, that's the way they are. And once you show them that they can work from home, you mix them up. And uh, I hope that they'll come back to work and uh, they'll work as well as before. But we, it, we will see. You mentioned immigration and tourism earlier. How important is it that the government open up the borders sooner rather than later, the international borders, do you think? I like, like everybody else, I think, is to have normal situation. The normal situation in this country with migrants has been from the first day. We're all migrants. Now, when we stop it, then it causes changes. Then we have to adjust. So. Really, the sooner we can have the migrants back and the sooner we can have the students back, the better. But I mean, I'm not running the country. They know what they're doing. My opinion on this is, is no stronger than anyone else. I just say what I feel. What effect are low interest rates having on the property market and how are you finding sales and leasing activity across your portfolio? Huge, huge, huge effect because the problem was our main buyers were Chinese and they are now non-existent. So I was very worried actually. But what happened was that the low rates of interest came in and the government was helping people besides that. And that overcame the problem of the Chinese. So that's what, so we were very happy about that. But we still didn't overcome the problem of the investors. We have to help them too if we want investors. Who are you finding you're competing with for sites? Is it local developers or is it international developers? I never competed with anyone. I just do my own thing and I wish them luck. One issue you've been vocal about in the past is the Barangaroo precinct, saying that you'd only buy to live there or to on sell and that the rents don't justify the prices. Take us through your thinking there. I think it's very good because we used land which was very valuable. That always makes sense to me when we use valuable land. I don't know enough about Barangaroo. Of course, I've been there, I've looked at it and all that. But really at night, Barangaroo is dead. The center of the city at night is here, just where you sit. Because that's where all the people live. Whereas in Barangaroo, come nighttime, there's no one there. Maybe in time, that'll change. But at this stage, that's what I find there. You recently purchased a development site in King Street in Melbourne. Take us through 2019 was the right time to buy in Melbourne after so long. I got to a stage where I have to go to different places. Otherwise, you become too big in one spot. I think it's healthier. And besides that, Sometimes Melbourne can be better, sometimes Sydney can be better, I don't know. But I definitely am Sydney. It doesn't matter if I build in Melbourne or not, that's only sideline. Because Sydney is where I am. And what about, say, Perth or Adelaide? Any plans to potentially develop? Oh, definitely it? not in Adelaide, and definitely not in Perth, no. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the build to rent sector? I think that the intention is very good, but they, they, but it doesn't seem to work out. If I build, I must keep it for 15 years or I can find somebody who will buy the whole development. And then if I want to sell it after 15 years, they have to approve my plans. So I don't think that I would like it. If they want to do it, I say, we should only keep it say for five years and we don't have to get any approvals afterwards. They have to approve it before I build quickly. And that's what I think, then it'll work. But the main thing is not how they legislate. The main problem is that the rents have not gone up. And so the investor is not as keen to buy as he would have been if the rents were going up. What are the fundamentals you look for when analyzing a development site? Again, it depends. When I prefer to look at places which are central, where people will have fun being there. I'm not looking for a secluded place. Don't want it, right? I want it where it's lively. I want it to be 
say in the upper half, but not real top. Say if you go from zero to 100, I would always look at ones between 60 and 80. That's my market. If you go above 80, it's a small market. Might be very profitable, but still small. If you go below 60, the units are too cheap and the cost of building is practically the same. So that's why, that's how I do it. Right? Then of course, I take into account the councils, if they're easy or hard, because they can cost a lot of money and a lot of time. You're one of the first and remain the largest developer to offer vendor financing loans for purchases. How much has that been taken up by potential buyers of apartments? Do you find a lot of buyers use it? So when I build many apartments in surface, then without vendor finance, I would have lost money. In Sydney, it's a luxury. So say, I think the unit is worth half a million and the market gives me 400,000. Then I say, oh, I'll give you finance. Maybe I'll get more. But today, when the finance is not important because the banks are more reasonable, which is very important because when I give when the finance, I'm more reasonable than they are. And second of all, the interest rates are very low. So that's okay. Today, it's not important. Traditionally, you've always been a developer of residential and commercial assets. Would you ever move into office or industrial? I have some offices. I have never been in industrial. I somehow don't like it. No, nothing wrong. I mean, I bought more industrial land than anyone because many people had industrial properties and they could only build one story high. When I come, I can build 10 stories high. So they got a lot more money. So they sold me the land. So I was always really used to knocking down the old industrial. But no, it, it doesn't appeal to me, no. Who do you look for for inspiration? Is there somebody that inspires you? It's nobody in particular, but the people in general. Now, if I see that the people are keen to buy, now that inspires me. If I see one guy who is very clever, I might get his idea, but I don't look for inspiration from him. What inspires me is the buyers. What would you say is the best deal you've ever done and what's the worst deal? All my buildings are the same. It's like asking your mother who, which child she likes the most. I did my best for all of them. Have you ever done a bad deal? I decided to build in surface and I hadn't been to surface at that time for five, 10 years. And I came in the middle of the night and I bought two sites. <laughs> and of course, one site was not the one that I looked at, it was across the road. That's how much I understood and my age. <laughs> so I mean, we were at, and also, well, the market turned bad, you see? So it happens. Probably the best deal I've ever done was in Israel. One day I was invited by Golda Meir. She was the prime minister. She invited the wealthy people of the world, so we went the Jews of the world, went there. And I got bored with the speeches, are rubbish, I listened to them. So I went out and I bought land. I bought land, and I mean, I have no idea of, of, of the Israeli market. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I know Israel, but I didn't know the market. So I bought the land, and within one or two weeks, I could have made a big profit. I said, I didn't come to speculate, I'm gonna build. So I started to build. Next two months, I couldn't give it away. Doesn't matter. By the time I finished, the market went up again, see? So there you are, that was a very good deal. I had no idea, that was just pot luck. <laughs> it looks right. <laughs> you mentioned uh, Israel there, obviously Frank Lowy, who I'm sure you know, lives there. Would you ever relocate from Australia back to, to, to live in Israel, or are you comfortable here? No, I have no intention of going anywhere. Well, because my life hasn't changed. I do now exactly what I did when I was 30 years old. The problem with people when they retire, as you see, they lose contact with the people they worked with. And because they're old, a lot of their mates are either in the nursing home 
or they're dead. So there's very little choice there. Hmm? So therefore, I say, that's why I like the country, because I'm here all the time, and I like, the, and I like to work. So that's why I would never leave. No. Now, you were born in China. How do you evaluate the Australia-China relationship at the moment? We must remember one thing. The Chinese people love Australia. They love Australia probably more than we do. Very important to know that. Not the government, I'm not talking about them. They play politics, that's a different story. I don't know if they love or hate, they're just politics. Today they'll love you, tomorrow no, don't worry about it. But the people love it because they went to a lot of trouble to buy apartments here. And they did it even when there was no profit. They just want to have some property, something here. So that's why I know that they believe in this country. And that's, in my opinion, that's the main thing. The rest is detail. What would you say is the biggest challenge facing the Meriton business today? The biggest challenge is the changes. Now, I liked always apartments. Say why I liked apartments against cottages. Because apartments lend themselves to leasing. Cottages don't lend. You have a cottage, and the upkeep is great, and the people are by themselves, they don't know what to do and all that. Generally, I like housing because the government cannot allow housing to collapse. So a very good partner, the government, can't get a better partner than that. Then I have the second partner, the banks. The banks can't allow the property, the, the residential property to drop. So with these two partners, I can face the world. How are you finding your relationships with the banks at the moment? Are they more willing to lend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, they were confused. They were convinced that they were no good. One day they were the best in the world, the next day they were no good. You can't be the best and no good at the same time. Our banks are very good. In my opinion, they're old women. That's something else. Maybe that's a good bank, I don't know. But they're, they're very good. I believe in our banks, they're all right. And tell us about some of the projects you've got on the go at the moment. I know there's ocean in the Gold Coast. What else have you got on the go? I have a, a big project in Parramatta. I have a, a big project in, in uh, Pagewood. I just finished two and a half thousand and I'm starting two and a half thousand units. Very big there, right? I have big projects in um, Ride, North Ride, very big project. Thousand units there. I have big projects in Hombush, very interesting area. I was very scared of it, but it's come good. Now that's an area which suddenly came good. I think they partly because the main railway station will be there. So that helps. But when I talk projects, they're, say, close to a thousand units or something. I'm not talking about the project with a hundred units. Right? Those I don't even count. I have those too. Like I have one in Mascot, a small one. I built up thousands of units in Mascot. Very good. I have a, I have a small one in uh, Zetland. Two small ones in Zetland. So I have plenty. Take us through a normal day for Harry Trigoboff. I get, I wake up about seven o'clock. I read the newspapers. I look at TV. Say every second day, I do a bit of exercise. Every second day, I go for a walk. Then I go to work. Then usually in the morning, I go on that site. In the afternoon, I'm always here. Then I come home. I come home and uh, I have a billiard table. I play billiards by myself. I'm not good, I can play a bit, and that's it. And after finishing the billiard table, I play with my wife a game called Find the Word. You know that game? Yeah. Yeah. We're about equal, it's very good that we're equal. So I find two identical books. So she tells me page 55. So she looks 55, I look 55. And we race who is going to find the words. And then after I finish that, I go to bed. Sometimes I'm not tired, so I look at my sheets. I bring sheets home from the job. 
from 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 the work. And then I go to sleep. And what about outside of work totally? I mean, what do you do to re-energize? Do you travel? And if so, where do you like to go? I just sleep. I sleep very well. So after I sleep, I'm energizing. Uh, that's how I energize. How important is building trust and loyalty? Your executive assistant's been with you for 19 years. I'm sure many of the other staff here have been with you just as long. How important is loyalty to you? I think all my staff is loyal. A lot of it has to do with the way I behave. If I work hard with them, then they think it's normal to work hard. Now, if I would be loafing, then they would loaf twice as much. So, <laughs> simple. I work hard because that's what I like to do. I, I consider it imperative that I work hard. You're still a young man. What's next for Meriton and Harry Triggerboff? Oh, well, we keep on doing this, we keep on growing. Must understand, I started one man, right? So I did everything. Very good. So I knew a little bit about everything. It's very good then, right? As I grew, of course, I got people to help. So one did that, one did that, one did that. Every important person I employed, I would work with him in the beginning. Usually, he was much more qualified than I was to do the job, but he didn't have my way of doing it. So, for a company to succeed, there must be a certain way of doing things, which is unique to that company. It doesn't have to be the best or the worst, but it has to be a way. So I had my way, and we worked in it, and eventually he was a lot better at doing whatever than I was. And that's the beauty of employing the right people, because they can do it better than you can, because you can't do everything in the end, right? But if you did everything in the beginning, that's a big plus. So I was very lucky that I started, so I did everything.